Okay, as you can tell, the level of the solvent is just above the layer of the sand. So what I've done, I've got a mixture of the methylene blue and fluorescein. Uh, methylene blue is a lot of times used in staining. The fluorescein has also found some type of uh, medicinal properties as well. What I'm gonna do is just add a couple of drops And then we want to rinse down the sides with the ethanol because we want all of that to be going onto the sand. And I think you can see the, the blue, the blue dye stuff will have less affinity for the aluminum than the yellow. The fluorescein is a yellow and then methylene blue, as the name implies, is a blue dye stuff. So what you are going to find is that the blue will move faster than the yellow component. The yellow doesn't want to move much at all. And once we get most of the blue out, we'll change solvents to something more polar to help push that along as well. When that layer of um, gets right above the sand again, I'm going to add more of the solvent. I don't want to add a lot of solvent right now because I don't want to dilute the sample. I want that to be as concentrated as possible onto the, the sand there. Get just a tap. I can still see a layer of the solvent above. Looks like most of the liquid has got drained onto the sand. So I'm gonna go ahead, we'll kind of fill this up. I'm not gonna fill it all the way. You can tell it still has a little bit of that uh, greenish color there. So I'm gonna let that drain a little bit and then I'll fill it up some more. You can start to see the methylene blue coming down, the blue band. You can tell the liquid, the solvent has drained uh, on top of the sand. So I'm gonna go ahead and, cause what we want is for this to be fairly colorless above. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of fill that to the top. And then again, you never want the solvent to go below your sand or sil uh, alumina sample and you can see where the band where we applied that sample this is our mixture notice that the blue is moving further down i'm not going to change this flask until most of the blue has come down here then we can change the flask um, and then start collecting the methylene blue while we're waiting just to talk a little bit more the difference or similarities similarities between thin layer chromatography and the um, column chromatography the thin layer can be a precursor as to what solvent system you'll use for the column chromatography. Uh, and it's really trial and error. When you choose solvents, if you know something about your compound, whether it's polar or nonpolar, that can kind of lead you maybe into a direction of which solvents might work. But it really boils down to trial and error. Uh, I know when I was in graduate school, a lot of times when I would do TLCs, I may have 20 to 30 chambers prepared and do TLCs and hopefully one of those would be have good results as far as separation. But the what nice thing is once I figure out what works well for thin layer chromatography, I can use that same solvent system to the bigger scale. Now obviously this is a very small apparatus here. Notice it's taking a tremendous amount of time for it to move. Um, there are other types of column chromatography you can use. One particular type is called flash column chromatography. And the nice thing about flash column chromatography is there is a reservoir where your um, solvent you will put in to the reservoir. And then off, coming off the reservoir, there is a tube that you can connect to a nitrogen tank. And you can blow nitrogen gas in and that pressure will cause it to move at a much faster pace. Um, so you can get something done a third of the time it would take or maybe even less time than you would see what we're doing today. Some other things about the column chromatography, 
What we're separating here has color associated with it. We're looking for a blue band. We're looking for a yellow band. In reality, there's a lot of organic compounds that are not colored. So how do you go about figuring out where are you collecting the material? If you have compounds that are fluorescent, you could shine a UV light onto your column and you may be able to detect the bands that way. Another thing that people will very um, often do is they will collect maybe 10 milliliter fractions and they may have a machine that actually does that for them, but they may take al aliquots of these 10 milliliter fractions that they're collecting and run a TLC on each one of those and then if they're the same, they can combine those fractions. So it is more tedious if your samples are not colored compared to if they are colored. There's no question here where we're seeing the blue band. And you can see it's moving down. It's taking its time. But again, this is one solvent system that works fairly well with these two different components in the mixture. Another thing I just want to point out here, um, again, I mentioned I probably should have used more sand. Uh, between the cotton and the silicate uh, alumina. The thing about when you do column chromatography, even if that was completely colorless, we typically like to filter that because there's always traces of sil silica or the alumina, whichever packing material you're using. There's always the trace that some of that can come through even though visually you don't see it. So most of the time when I've done column chromatography before, I would filter it before I did anything else with it. When I collected the fractions, I would filter it through something that was called a fritted glass funnel. And it has these small pores in it that nothing will go through except what you want to go through your liquid. So even though we see it here, even if I didn't see this, if I wanted to make sure that sample was pure and had no alumina or silica gel in it, I would filter it through one of those fritted glass filters. As you can see, the blue band has moved almost down to the bottom of the, the, the column, if you will, the, the pipette. Um, and you can tell that there's some blue liquid that's in the tip of the pipette. We're gonna let this go. I'm gonna try to collect some of this blue material, which is the methylene blue. You may be able to see just a tint of yellow near the top. This is the fluorescein uh, dye stuff. So we're going to let most of the blue come out and then I'm gonna change solvents. What I have in here now is ethanol. So we'll change this to water and that more polar solvent will interact with the fluorescein and start moving it down. We may not have enough time to collect the, the yellow material, the fluorescein, but I do want you to be able to see how we can start to move that band down the column. And just something uh, for future reference, um, I noticed, I, and I did switch the flask to collect only the blue material now, uh, but what we had before, which was ethanol, you can tell it has some of this, the aluminum that's in there. So uh, just FYI, I would probably cut down on the amount of cotton. Uh, I think it may flow a little bit faster if this wasn't so thick. And then I would have a thicker band of the sand there. I'm happy with the way it looks up top. Uh, I'm happy with how it is moving down. Um, and it is possible, if you ever see this happen too, um, sometimes when you're doing a column chromatography experiment, sometimes you may see bubbles or holes or gaps. And usually what happens, we call that channeling. And it's not uncommon for that to happen. And a lot of that has to do with how well you pack the material. If you didn't tap it as it was being the alumina or silica gel, whichever adsorbent you're adding, uh, if, if you didn't pack it correctly, you can have gaps in there and those gaps will show through during the experiment. If you notice, a lot of our blue has uh, been going down toward the bottom of our column. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead, ideally what we would do is collect all this blue, but just for time purposes, Again, you would collect all the blue and then we would change solvents. All of the ethanol has gone through, so I'm gonna change solvents, I'm using water. So I'm gonna put water in here and what we should see is that the yellow band, which is the fluorescein, should start moving down with this more polar solvent. Again, ideally, 
we would let all the blue, we would collect all the blue, methylene blue material. Then we would change the flask. We've already changed our solvent here. And then we would collect the yellow. As you can see, the um, water's been flowing through the column and you can see the, pre the appearance of this uh, yellow band near the top. That's the fluorescein. We're still recovering some of our um, methylene blue here. We're gonna let this go a little bit longer just so that you can see that band, uh, but you can certainly see the yellow now is moving. Did not move with the ethanol, but is moving with the water just by changing to a more polar substance. Uh, just wanted to uh, take another look at the uh, column. If you notice at the top, you can see that yellow band has gotten larger. It is moving down the column. Uh, due to time constraints, we're gonna stop the experiment here. Again, I just wanna reemphasize that we started with a mixture of methylene blue and fluorescein, and we packed the column with our alumina, uh, put our sample at the top, first solvent we used was ethanol. The methylene blue had more affinity for the ethanol than it did for the aluminum. That's the reason it's moving down the column. In an ideal situation, we would have let the all of the methylene blue be collected in a flask, and you can see how much darker that flask is in terms of the contents. After we would have collected all of the methylene blue, we would have switched over to the water, which I did. And then now you can see the fluorescein is starting to move down. Water is a much more polar solvent. This may take another hour for it to complete. Therefore, we're gonna stop at this point. But I think you can see that we can use column chromatography to separate two different components in a mixture based on their affinity for the adsorbent, which is the aluminum here. This is our stationary phase compared to the solvent. Some people call that eluent or solvent, which is the mobile phase. Same premise that TLC works, then layer chromatography, we're just doing it on a column scale.